What a beautiful word, the word forgiven. My goodness, Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for the grace that you give, the love that you share, and the hope that we have because of the cross. May we embrace the reality of forgiveness. It's in your name that we pray, and all those who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Grab your Bibles, family. Turn with me first to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, put a finger there once you get to Psalm 22. Then I want you to turn with me to Matthew 27. So Psalm 22, put a little place there. And then Matthew 27. My name is Josh. I'm one of the ministers here at Clear Creek. Welcome to our family. If this is your first time or one of your many times, we're so glad to be together celebrating Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I got to tell you, I'm excited because we're in the middle of a teaching called The Seven Sayings. From the cross. These are the seven words of Christ, the seven big things he says while on the cross, before he dies, taking your sin and mine to the grave with him. And so each week we've listened and looked at some of these. We have looked at the words of forgiveness Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We saw the word of reassurance. Today you will be with me in paradise. We saw the word of family. Mother, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. And today we look at what I believe may be one of the most emotionally laden, but blessings and beneficial words of all of them. For in it we see a picture of God that I think we all need, maybe more often than we realize. Now, full full disclosure, Some of the things I'm sharing with you today, I first heard from a brilliant man named Mike Glenn, so if it sounds smart, it probably came from him, but I'm going to do my best to share with you this fourth statement. And today's message, there's only two points, but I hope you'll listen very closely to both of them. I want to begin with just a little factoid. Some of you appreciate these, so let me sort of start here with something that may be of value. The American lifespan has for decades been on the rise. The median age, how long people are living, it was in the mid-50s, then it went to the mid-60s, and then into the 70s. And so today, there are children being born today who will live to be 100 years old. But we've noticed something in the trends, something in the data that has been concerning those who take note of these things. In fact, those who stay up late at night worrying about these began to notice the trend that although over the past number of decades life expectancy has gone up, it is starting to go back down in America. And so they began to dig into the data to figure out what was going on, and what they found is there's one group in America whose life expectancy has changed so much, it's affecting the overall American average. You say, which group is it? Well, it is young, predominantly white men age 19 to 34 who have given in to alcohol, to drugs, and yes, even to life-taking suicide. And it's because they have come to a point where they believe that there is nothing worth living for, that what they have faced is greater than the hope of tomorrow. They've said, I can't hope in the future that they have given up on the present. Sociologists call these deaths of despair deaths of despair. By the way, we're familiar with deaths of despair, aren't we? Now, they go by different names for us. They may not be quite as critical as life-taking, but we all know various moments where we feel despairing over life. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, Some of us, we want to lose weight, and so we commit. We will go to the gym, and we will work out. And so you get your clothes on, you get those shorts on, you look like an unmade bed, but you go to the gym, you get on the treadmill, you get on the Stairmaster, you lift the weights, and you run and you run and you run and you run and run. You lift and you lift and you lift and you lift and you lift. You sweat profusely, you look down at that little screen that tells you how much you've done, and it says you have now burned a total of 15 calories. Congratulations, that's one potato chip. And you despair. It's not worth it. I can't get to where I want to go. What I'm experiencing is too great. Or, for instance, some of you who are in school, especially you want to learn math, or your teacher wants you to learn math, let's be honest. So you work and you work and you work. You work the problems. You try to do the formula. You do all the things you know to do, and you can't 
get it. You try and you try. You have wads of paper on the floor from all your tries and failures. And you get to a point, if you're like me, where you say, there is no hope. I've tried. I can't figure it out. Or you serve at the homeless shelter. You bless people, you serve food, you hand out blankets, and you bless one person, but behind that one person you see another, and another, and another, and a whole crowd behind them. And so, yeah, you helped one, but so what? There are so many. It's easy to despair and think that what you're doing has no benefit to the people around you. What does it matter? And it is easy, and yes, tempting to give up to despair. Would you believe it? That on the cross, Jesus himself was tempted to despair. We hear those words in Matthew chapter 27. Would you stand with me this morning as we read the word of the Lord? This is the fourth statement from the cross. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Would you bow with me? Father, it's in these words we hear the cry of our heart so often. I pray this morning as we listen to Jesus' words, we would hear the words underneath them and the hope they provide. We ask this now in Jesus' name and all those who agreed said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is Jesus' fourth statement. And I told you already, here you go. There are two points we're going to look at this morning. I know some of you feel like you're getting shortchanged. But preacher, aren't you supposed to have three points? Not today, only two. And here's the first point. The first thing you need to hear from Jesus is that Jesus understands your despair. These words from the cross, the first thing that he needs you to hear this morning is that he understands the fear the frustration, and yes, the moments of despair when you believe all hope is lost and you're tempted to give up. Now, Jesus is going through a horrible experience. Amen? Amen. We have talked about the horrors of the cross the past few weeks, and we will continue through to Easter. But let us remember, Jesus has gone through over a 12-hour period of torture. He has been beaten and brutalized. He is dying from blood loss. He has been nailed to a cross. He has been spat upon and abandoned. He is undergoing terrible experience. And this passage gives us an extra flavor or dimension to it. It's so bad for Jesus, we're told, that even creation closes its eyes to see what's happening. Did you hear the text? It says, from noon until 3 p.m., darkness came over all the land. Now, we want to know when we read this, well, what kind of darkness was it? Was it a supernatural darkness? Did God create a solar eclipse? Did he tell the stars, the sun, and the moon to go to sleep for a little while? Or was it maybe a bit more natural? Was it simply a dark blanket of clouds? And the short answer is, we don't know. Well, we do know. What was happening to the Creator was so horrific that His creation covered its eyes, unable to watch. And it's in that darkness that Jesus screams out to the Father. Yes, the word cried out literally means screamed. Anaboao. He screamed. The, The phrase we use, cried out, does not carry with it the punch of His experience. The weight of your sin and my sin, the guilt that comes from that choice, the things we have done laid on him, the beatings he had undertaken, the abuse, the abuse, the the, the emotional strain, all of it was now so great that in the moment on the cross, he does not simply cry out, he screams. And he pours out all of his hurt, all of his loneliness, all of the frustration. The weight of sin comes tumbling out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, the interesting little phrase here, these words, my God, my God. He addresses the Father as God. Now, this is very interesting. 
Every other time in the Gospels, when Jesus specifically addresses the Father, he does not call him God, but he calls him Abba, the Hebrew word for Father, a term of intimacy, of closeness. But here, when darkness fell, when Jesus carried your sin and mine, it is in this moment Jesus does not call him Abba, Father, you are close, but he calls him God. For in this moment, he is tempted to feel this distance and disconnection from God. Why have you forsaken me? Does this prayer sound familiar to anyone else? Sure it does. Some of you have prayed this before. I have prayed this before in our own words, not just once or twice, but there have been dozens and in some of our lives, hundreds of times, where the weight of what is hitting us is so great, we feel as though God himself has left. We feel separated because of what, because of the cancer that ravages our friend's body, because of our marriage that is coming to an end, no matter how much we fight for it because of the children that are making decisions that break our hearts and make us angry all at once, because of this situation or even just the weight of our own sin when we recognize what we have done, it is tempting to believe God has abandoned us. But did you hear the word I used? Tempted. We are tempted to believe something that may not actually be true. In fact, the first thing Jesus wants you to know is he understands how you feel. He understands your despair. And in fact, it's for this very reason that the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 4 writes these beautiful words that Christians in moments of difficulty have held on to for centuries. In chapter 4, for we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but We have one who has been tempted in every way. He has been tempted in every way, including to believe God is not there just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Why? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The Hebrew writer tells us, Jesus knows what you are going through. But Josh, some of you will ask, didn't God abandon Jesus on the cross? Doesn't his statement, why have you forsaken me, mean that God forsook Jesus? Well, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But in this moment, I just want you to recognize that Jesus understands what you're going through this morning, friend. He understands the weight of your despair. And it's because he understands that we, in confidence, can sing. We're going to take a moment. In fact, we're going to sing a reminder of his presence even in our despair. Don't worry, we will answer the question you're wondering. Did God abandon Jesus? But before we do, let us take a moment and acknowledge Christ knows what we're going through because for some of you, you need to know you are not alone in this moment. Christ knows what you're going through. This is a hard season for many of you. Jesus understands. And it's because of that that we can sing these words in confidence. Would you sing with us? So 
Jesus understands. This past week on Wednesday, I went to Nashville to see a show with two of my favorite people in the world, my brothers-in-law, Kevin and Kyle. And it was one of those times this week where it had been a full week, but when I was with them, everything else just sort of fell off. You know what I'm talking about. You, you begin to just goof off. The jokes fly. One person begins a joke and someone else finishes it. Do you have a friend like that where you start a sentence and someone else can finish it? It was one of those moments. And I got to tell you, as I was driving back home, I thought about this passage because this passage is telling me that Jesus Christ finishes the sentence of your despair because He knows what it's like. He understands what you go through and what I go through. He has in every way been tempted. He has in every way experienced the pain of life. You know, one of the things that sin does is it makes us numb. Have you ever thought about this? Uh, sin does this thing where it calluses our heart where we are unable to feel fully and we are not sensitive to things. Let me give you a couple examples. So perhaps you, you take the good gift of fruit of the vine and you become addicted to it. You take more than one drink, two drinks, three drinks, and what once was a blessing, you now need a lot more to get a buzz. Or someone begins to take a substance and what once would give them a buzz, just this little hit. They need more and more and more to have the same effect. Why? Because you become numb. Or some of you know the pain of becoming addicted to pornography where you see something and what once stirred your heart, you now need more and more and stronger and stronger to have the same feeling. Why? Because sin numbs us. And because of that numbing, what ends up happening is many of us are tempted to believe that God is distant because we can't feel His closeness. What I want you to hear that Christ, carrying the full weight of your sin and mind, understand He is experiencing the sense of guilt that we all have in this moment. It is easy to believe that God has abandoned us. But just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean it is true. The first thing Jesus says is, I understand where you are. The second thing he teaches us is the truth that God has not abandoned us. A friend of mine, a guy I know, talks about this at length. He and his daddy are best buddies. And he says years ago his father was studying this very phrase of Christ on the cross. And his father said to this gentleman, he said to his son, he said, isn't this the moment where Christ, because of our sin, because of taking on our burden, isn't this the moment where God turns his back to his son? That's what's happening here, correct? And the son said, dad, how is that possible? And the dad says, well, Jesus took our sin. God cannot be in the presence of sin. Therefore, God was separated from the Son in this moment. Right. Now, my friend was wise enough not to argue terribly with his father. He didn't point out the logical problem with that statement. You say, what's that? Is Jesus God, church? By the way, the answer is yes. Let's try this. It's it's yes. Okay. Is Jesus God? Yes. So how does God the Father, God, separate from God the Son? How does Jesus ceased being God in that moment. He can't. See, the reason we think that's what's going on here is because we don't know our Old Testaments. Friend, know your Scriptures. Jesus did not pick this phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, out of a hat. He did not make it up in the moment. Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament Psalm, Psalm 22. Grab your Bibles. Look with me. The very first phrase in Psalm 22 is this phrase, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you read through the rest of the psalm, you will see that the psalm is a messianic psalm. What does that mean? It is a psalm or a song prophesying or telling who the Messiah is who the chosen one will be, and what he will endure. And so Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the rest of the psalm begins to depict what Christ would endure on the cross. So verse 7 says, all who see me mock me. 
They hurl insults at me. Isn't this what the crowds and the religious leaders are doing at the foot of the cross? Verse 8, they say, let the Lord rescue him. These are the words of the thief next to Jesus, are they not? And verse 15, my mouth is dried up. Jesus will utter these words next week. That is the next phrase we will look at. And then 16, they pierce my hands and my feet. Jesus was held to a cross with nails in his hands and in his feet. And then in verse 18, notice, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots, meaning they gamble for my garments. This is what the guards were doing at the foot of Jesus' cross. Psalm 22 is saying this is who Messiah will be, this is what Messiah will do, and this is what Messiah will endure. Now, what you need to understand is to the Jewish mind, when you quote one portion of the psalm, you are quoting the whole psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what I will endure. And we think, aha, God has turned his back on Jesus. But friends, we have not read the whole psalm, have we? Because it says in verse 24, these words of Jesus, for he, God, has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one, Jesus. He, this is God, has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Even when we feel like God has abandoned us, even when we feel tempted to believe that even God can't fix what is wrong, even when we feel that we have gone too far, even the grace of God surely is not there. Jesus in this moment quotes the despair and the confidence that yes, He knows what you're going through, and yes, God is still with you. Amen. For on the cross, for on the cross, my friend, he goes on to tell his daddy, he says, Dad, you say that God turned His back on Jesus. He said, let me ask you a question. If I was on the cross would you have done that to me? And his dad, with tears in his eyes, felt almost like his boy had slapped him across the face said, No. You're telling me, Dad, that in the moment where Jesus has faithfully done everything God called him to do, he has fulfilled everything, he is now on the cross, he is doing what God has called him to do, that God the Father would then say, And now you're on your own. The truth of Scripture, Psalm 22, tells us that in that moment, even though we may feel abandoned by God, Jesus Christ was not alone on the cross. God did not take them off of the cross, but he was with him in that moment. Friend, you need to hear two things. Jesus understands the despair you feel, but the truth is you are not alone. God has not abandoned you. You have not gone too far. You have not done too much to outreach the grace of God. He forgives. He gives grace. He gives healing. And whatever you are feeling today does not dictate the love of God. For as our brother Paul says, I am convinced that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, on the cross we see God sees and feels what you feel and the promise that He will not leave you even though you feel alone. This is the fourth statement on the cross. I, I don't know where you are this morning, but I want you to know wherever you are, God is near you. 